So we're working with patience this month, the parami of patience. And as Jay talked about, it's definitely not my strength. <laughs> definitely not. And I imagine that many here might relate. You know, impatience so connected to our conditioning and our society. And every time I think of patience or really impatience, I think about the character Veruca Salt from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Some of you may know she was one of the kids and she was very spoiled. And she would say repeatedly, I want it now. I want it now about everything, about the golden ticket. She wanted everything. And that feeling we all may know to some degree of really wanting something to be different right now. And I wanted to kind of play with and break down that phrase of hers, I want it now, because I think it actually highlights what this practice of patience can point us to and help us really see. So the I, I want it now. Often when we're caught in impatience, there's that me at the center of everything. Right? That's the perspective that the mind is in. That selfing that's right at the root of it. And then I want, I want it now. I think this parami of patience is really invites us to look at the energy of wanting and how so much of our time is spent wanting things to be other than they are and believing that if things were different, we'd feel better. If we got what we wanted, things would be better. And I want it, right? That it, I want it connected, I think, to the delusion the delusion that we can so often carry and believe um, that happiness really is to be found outside of us in getting something or having things be just, just so, right? Just how we would like them. And the now, of course, I want it now. And impatience is all about that urgency and that immediacy that this moment has to be different. And I can't wait for it to be different. I actually have to try to manipulate or control it, right? So we see that impulse to kind of control our circumstances. So even in this phrase, right, I want it now, I think we can see kind of the ego, the selfing, meanness, not being able to be with unpleasant experience, wanting it to be different, the belief, delusion that we can control things, and that if we did, ah, then, I, then I'd be okay. And, you know, you may not exactly see yourself in Baruch Assault. You might dismiss her as being spoiled or greedy. And she never had to be with that feeling for very long. No matter though, what she was given, her unhappiness and her discontent really persisted. And it feels important that she's a child. I think, you know, we get all these messages about patience in particular when we're growing up. And often when we move into these new uh, practices, when there's a translation, we wanna kind of look at what are our associations to that. And so, you know, you might begin to think about or already know what were you taught as a kid about patience? My sense is often it was a sort of demand, something to do, you know, being told to wait, to sit tight, that good things come to those who wait. And there was often, I think, sort of 
there is still a strictness and a shaming in it. And I think the parami of patience is quite different. We're not asking ourselves to kind of like forcibly wade and grit our teeth until we get to the good stuff. It's not sitting on our hands and then we'll get a cookie or get rewarded. Certainly not saying that if we practice patience, pleasant experience will show up. That it's like the goodness is the practice itself. <laughs> the lessons we learn from slowing it all down and watching how we want things to be different and the urgency in that. And Achan Sujito, I think, says this beautifully and perfectly. He says, the Buddha pointed not to physical asceticism, which he frequently spoke against, but of the restraint of holding the heart still in the presence of its suffering until it lets go of the ways in which it creates that suffering. That is, the mind-heart habitually creates suffering and stress through reacting to, holding on to, or getting caught up with what life throws at us. All of the paramis contribute to the lessening or dismantling of that dukkha, but the specific quality of patience is to carry the heart through the turbulence of existence so that it no longer shakes, sinks, or lashes out. And I really appreciate the poetry of his phrases, holding the heart still in the presence of its suffering. The quality of patience is to carry the heart through the turbulence of existence. We can hear how this practice is in so many ways about that second arrow, right? Working with how we add to our own suffering. And I can hear and fit, feel the kindness and compassion in how he describes this. We're, again, we're not being strict and kind of judgmental when we're impatient. We're not holding the heart with that energy, but gently looking, carrying the heart when it's shaking and lashing out in reaction to what's probably already difficult and unpleasant. And, you know, coming back to Veruca Salt, of course she didn't have that capacity to hold herself gently, to hold her reactivity gently. But again, she really wasn't a happy child. A lot of dis-ease and suffering, never content. And so, so I think about this kind of holding the heart in the midst of impatience, in the midst of, I want it now. Thinking about how we don't have control over that now, that urgency is really misaligned with the truth of how things are. That the world, our bodies, other people have their own timeline. And I've been thinking about that kind of holding this question of like, whose timeline is my mind on? Because I've, I've been having a flare of a chronic illness recently and noticing just how incredibly impatient my mind is about getting better. It absolutely does not want to be with the unpleasantness, the, the kind of suffering of being sick and the impact that it has on my life. And so it's like, has to change now. I want to see that I'm getting better now. <laughs> and my body really has its own timeline, different timeline, and it needs time to heal. And I watch my mind again and again, just really not liking that. It's shaking and lashing out and sinking that Achan Sujito talked about. I want health now. I want stability now. And so you know, I watch how I wind up turning away and grasping. And those three 
uh, react reactions that Achan Shizito talks about, all three of them I relate to. The suffering of the shaking, that inability to be with or sit or allow, like I just can't do it. <laughs> and the sinking, the moments that I have felt of sinking into despair and grief and shutdown because it feels just sort of hopeless and impossible to wait and not have control. And the lashing out, definitely I have had many moments of irritability and frustration. And so this image of holding the heart, holding the mind heart still in the presence of all of that is really helpful to me. And, you know, coming back to why do we do this? Why do we do this? If it's not because things will get better, right? We don't have a guarantee. Why do we do it? <laughs> and I can really humorously bring to mind when I'm impatient the I want it now. Noticing it, not to judge myself, not to demand that I not be impatient, but to see how I add to the suffering that's already here, right? That second arrow. I can learn so much by slowing it down. I see the identification with the illness. I see the not liking and the demand for control. And so that's really what we, we can learn so much by watching impatience. And Achan, Achan Sujito says, uh, points to this as well. I'll end by this quote because it feels really hopeful to me. It helps me feel motivated when sometimes it's like, oh, I'm never going to get rid of impatience, right? I'll never get rid of it. <laughs> I'm so impatient about my impatience. Um, so he says, reactivity isn't the truth of the mind. Reactivity isn't the truth of the mind. It's a conditioned reflex and it's not self. Because of that, suffering can be undone. And when it is, the mind is free. So, thank you for listening. Thanks for your attention. And uh, let's transition to practice. We get to practice this together. Ah. So let's turn toward these bodies, these minds, and hearts with as much gentle patience as possible. Let's see what's needed to come into a really comfortable and grounded posture. Mm. Anything that needs to open, move, release. We can invite a couple deeper breaths sometimes to support that process of settling and unwinding and arriving again. And really give yourself some time with this, this important, precious opportunity to connect to the body and support its settling. Maybe bringing attention to shoulders, just letting them soften. the muscles in the face and brow. Let the eyes close if that's comfortable. Really feel the relief of that, the rest in that. Be noticing 
the ribs, the abdomen moving with the breath. You don't have to change or control that in any way. Arms and hands can rest. We can feel ourselves sitting and making contact with the ground or chair. Notice any tingling or energy that might be moving through the limbs. Just slowing down. And if it's possible, connecting to whatever energy attitude of patience you can hold toward yourself and sprinkle some drops of that into the holding environment. Patience with the body, patience with our mind, that shakes and lashes out and sinks.
And as you practice with this, just notice if at any point, even the practice of patience itself becomes tight or rigid or judgmental at the edges. Remembering that we're not kicking out of our field of awareness anything that isn't patience. But relating to whatever's here, whatever is arising, with as much patience as is possible. A slowing down, slowing down that's imbued with kindness and care. Holding, holding and carrying our reactivity. <laughs> 